Poughkeepsie, New York, quaint and peaceful. She's living the perfect life with the perfect family, in the perfect house, in the perfect town. But all that ends tonight. They were watching her. She was being watched. A triangle of illicit passion with suspects and surprises at every twist and turn. The number one suspect is always the other spouse. In this town, a soul can be bought cheap. But when the bribe money runs out, someone still has to pay. Poughkeepsie, known as the Queen City of the Hudson, hugs the Hudson River and lies 75 miles north of New York City in the seat of Dutchess County. Pleasant Valley, New York is, it's right over the border of Connecticut in the corner of the state. Pleasant Valley, I would describe much like the name Pleasant. Although New York is not New England, it is a quaint New England type of sleepy town. Rich in history, it's where the U.S. Constitution is ratified in 1788. And New York becomes the 11th colony to join together as the United States of America. Poughkeepsie is a vigorous hybrid of rural, urban, suburban, working class, and Ivy League. It's very homey, it's very community oriented, and the people are all friendly. I mean, you have robberies, you have drug related crimes, but the one thing you don't see in Pleasant Valley is murder. It's October 28, 1999. Church choir practice at the Pleasant Valley United Methodist Church in Poughkeepsie finishes up for the night, and the friends say their good nights. It's a white church. The parking lot is across the street. And Susan comes out of choir practice. She's talking with a friend. And she walks across the street, waves goodbye to her friend. Other people are getting into the cars. She gets into her car and she sits down. They were watching her. She was being watched. As she puts her seatbelt buckle on, all of a sudden, six shots are fired into her. And these are basically at point blank range. Started firing, just kept firing a gun at the car. As people from choir practice are beginning to see what's going on. They run to the car, they go in, they dial 911, state police arrive, local police arrive, EMTs arrive, and Susan Fassett is still alive. Susan Fassett is a farmer's daughter, a tall, attractive blonde, age 48. She's a slim and fit mother of two who lives with her husband and children in the town of Pleasant Valley. This part of Dutchess County is rapidly developing from working farms to sprawling malls. Susan is passionate about raising her family. She took the kids everywhere. Yankee games, cat skills, on vacations, skiing. They went and did everything together. As well as a devoted mother, she's a busy professional, employed by the city of Poughkeepsie. She worked in human resources for the town, so she hired people. Energetic and engaged with life from early morning till late at night, Susan can be spotted around town driving a flashy brand new SUV. She participates in fitness classes at the community center, nurtures her family, and supports her place of worship. She goes to church three times a week, Sundays, and then she practices with the choir. There appears to be nothing special about that Thursday night when, just like everyone else in her choir, Susan Fassett has dinner with their family, and then she leaves for singing rehearsal at the Pleasant Valley United Methodist Church. On the outside, if you look at Susan Fassett's life, she's living the perfect life with the perfect family, in the perfect house, in the perfect town. She participates in a normal night of choir practice, an activity she loves. Susan is at choir practice, 
and she's singing her heart out. And choir practice ends. But no one could know this night is far from normal. Susan Fassett is identified to police by her friends at the scene. Susan Fassett, she's the wife of the lieutenant in the police department. She's a mother of two. She works for the town of Poughkeepsie. There was a pulse. E the EMS was there. They treated her. They tried to stabilize her. And they rush her to the hospital. Witnesses report that the car parked next to Susan's vehicle takes off at top speed after the shots. They didn't know what kind of car it was. A couple of the choir members even give a partial license plate number and describe it as a metallic covered station wagon. That's pretty distinct. So the state police have things to go on. Officers search the scene for clues. Susan's friends and choir mates are stunned by the savage attack in the church parking lot. If that happens, anything is possible. There were shell casings at the scene. The shell casings at the scene were recovered, collected, and brought to the ballistics laboratory where they were sent for analysis. As Susan is trying to be saved in the emergency room at the hospital, investigators are rushing to see if they can find this perpetrator. And they run that partial plate and the description of the vehicle. Very swiftly, the search on the partial plate produces unexpected and ominous results. And what they come up with is Jeff Fassett, a lieutenant in the police force. The match is for Susan's husband, Jeff Fassett's car. The number one suspect is always the other spouse. 85% of the cases, that's the case. He's a cop, he's a lieutenant, so he can be armed. And they decide to call out their SWAT team. They get the SWAT team and they surround the Fassett home. They're in the woods, hiding in the dark. So Jeff Fassett is at home with his son and his son's girlfriend. In fact, Jason Fassett, the son, and his girlfriend are leaving. And they go back inside the house and they say, Dad, what's going on? There are cops everywhere, across the street, in the bushes. What's going on? Jeff was a police officer, so all these cops that went to his house knew him. And... They felt bad. Jeff Fassett, police lieutenant, and his son and son's girlfriend are surrounded by Jeff Fassett's own police force. They were having problems, Sue and her husband. So Jeff Fassett explains, yeah, I knew she was having an affair. Inside the ER, Susan is fighting for her life, and she loses that fight. In a town of the very rich and the very poor, the Fassett family appeared to be regular, upstanding people. But on the night of October 28th, 1999, Susan Fassett is gunned down. Her police lieutenant husband, Jeff Fassett's car, is a match for the speeding getaway car, and their home is surrounded by police. They're in the woods, hiding in the dark. Jeff Fassett, police lieutenant, phones his own workplace to find out what's happening to his family. First thing you're going through the guy's mind is, what did I do? And if he didn't do nothing, then of course you've got nothing to worry about. Maybe it's a mistaken identity, or that would definitely be going through my mind. Well, what did I do? But soon, the SWAT team moves in to take down the Fassets. Jeff Fassett says, I have no idea what's going on. But no sooner do they do that, does the SWAT team roll in Take Jason and his girlfriend, tackle them to the ground, handcuff them, and then rush into the house and grab Jeff Bassett. They brought them down to the police station. I heard that it was a very difficult interview. This crime was in its infancy. It just happened. Jeff tells them, I was home all night long. They go very fast. Get as much information as you can. One of the things that state police do to Jeff Bassett is... They give him a polygraph. Police do not explain to the facets why they're being questioned. Now here is the horrible part of this. The mother of Jason and the wife of Jeff is fighting for her life as they are being questioned 
about her potential murder. And they don't even know what happened to her. And they broke the news to him that the, you know, his vehicle was uh, involved in a shooting. Inside the ER, Susan is fighting for her life, and she loses that fight. Susan Fassett dies from those six gunshot wounds. Police now have a murder on their hands. Susan Fassett's body will go to autopsy as the interrogation of the Fassett's continues. Police grill the Fassett's for about 10 hours. It's only at the end of that interview that they say, the reason why we're doing this is because, you know, your wife, your mother, she's been murdered, she's dead. That's how they find out about Susan Fassett being gunned down during an interrogation. They asked Jeff if, if he was involved, and he said absolutely not. However, it's shiny surface of the perfect marriage. All is not well between Jeff and Susan Fassett. They were having problems, Sue and her husband. In September 1999, Jeff gets proof of an affair through his wife's phone calls. He confronts her, and she admits the truth. Jeff immediately moves into an apartment attached to their house. The marriage seems like it's over. But in time, they decide to seek help and save their relationship. Sometimes 20 years go by and people grow apart. And Susan and her husband, they were getting along great, but they just weren't emotionally connected anymore. Jeff forgives Susan, and they decide to reconcile and renew their vows in a symbolic gesture. They throw away their old wedding bands and buy new ones. She wants to reconcile with her husband. She loves her husband. She loves her family. She loves her life. But she's just having maybe a breakdown of some sort. Jeff Fassett picks up his new wedding band five weeks later on the day Susan is gunned down. So Jeff Fassett explains, yeah, I knew she was having an affair, but I didn't kill her. The polygraph results are favorable to Jeff Fassett. He passes it. I mean, what else does the guy have to say? Not only that, but he's a lieutenant in the police department himself. It's discovered that there is an early mistake in the case. The license plate reported seen leaving the crime that led them to Jeff Fassett is incorrectly processed. The confusion about why they went after Jeff Fassett is that this batch screwed up the license plate numbers and actually gave police Susan Fassett's license plate number. So it looked like Jeff had left that scene and it was all a mistake. There are more revelations. The autopsy reveals that Susan has had sex within 48 hours. Authorities want to know if that partner was Jeff. When Jeff Fassett offers up his DNA, he becomes very distraught because he realizes, wow, I didn't sleep with my wife, so that means somebody else did. Faced with this devastating information, Jeff Fassett tells investigators who they should pick up. He believes he knows the man who is capable of killing Susan. I know I didn't kill her. Let's talk to this guy. Jeff Fassett gives the police a name. Everything is happening so fast. You got a victim. They got the plate number. And they, they inadvertently ran the wrong plate number. But that mistake turned out to give a suspect. So inadvertently, it wasn't a total wash with the wrong plate because the husband gave up Fred Andros, who that could be a prime suspect. Susan Fassett is gunned down and killed outside of her church choir practice. Her husband Jeff tells police their marriage has been rocky due to Susan's affair. Jeff Fassett believes that he and his wife are reconciled, but the autopsy reveals that Susan recently had sex and it wasn't with him. Jeff Fassett tells police the identity of Susan's affair. The man who he believes is capable of killing Susan. Their affair has been going on for years. And Susan's former lover is a surprise. The individual, a well-known and well-hated person in Poughkeepsie, Fred Andros. 
When you mentioned Fred Andros's name, people would immediately go, oh, that guy. Number one, Fred Andros is corrupt as they come. He's also charismatic, unattractive, and highly promiscuous. My father wasn't even that good looking, to be honest with you, but things that he said to women, you're beautiful, you look so nice today. Even in wet restaurants to, to waitresses, he, he'd call them honey, make them feel really good. Thanks for your good job. He'd go over and give them a big tip and then leave a small tip on the table. So he was very much a charmer. And women liked him a lot because he was, he was like that. You have people that walk in the room, they turn heads, people are looking at saying, oh, look at this guy. Then you got Fred Andros comes in and people are looking and turning around and Fred Andros thinks he's this guy. Married four times, Andros juggles affairs with several women at the same time and indulges in a predilection for prostitutes. He was with so many women, I can't even count them. And all these affairs were even when he was married to every wife. Jeff Fassett believes that his wife's former affair, Fred Andros, is the person police should talk to. Why don't you go see that Fred Andros? Because that's who she's screwing around with. Now go see him. I know I can kill her. Go talk to this guy. Police act fast on Jeff Fassett's tip. So they go to his house, two o'clock in the morning that night, and bang on his door. And Fred is just, you know, what the hell do you want? No, I'm not answering any of your questions. Fred is very, very abrasive when it comes to law enforcement. Fred Andros is used to calling the shots. Fred asks them, why are you even here? Why are you waking me up in the middle of the night? And he's abrasive and he's angry. And then they tell him Susan Fassett has been murdered. And we know you had an affair with her. And Fred actually gets very upset about this, hearing of her death. Not only is the affair over, Fred also claims that he can prove where he was at the time of the murder. And then Fred gives them an alibi, because they ask him, where were you? He gives them an alibi. There's no way. There's no way he would have done that. Fred Andros spends three decades as water boss for the town of Poughkeepsie, beginning in 1966. Fred Andros had a reputation in Poughkeepsie, in Pleasant Valley, as this guy that, in one way, you didn't want to mess with because he controlled the water permits in the town. So if you had anything to do with water, you didn't want to mess with Fred. On the other hand, you mentioned Fred's name and people would be like, ah, oh, that guy, you know, he thinks he's a big shot, but he's a no one. He works in a corrupt culture of kickbacks. Fred takes bribes, but they are sanctioned by officials higher up than Fred. You went to Fred if you were putting in a small strip mall. And you needed the water inspected the lines, everything, before you could move on. Fred was the type of guy where he'd allow you to lay all the pipes in, say, a five-acre parking lot. And he'd allow you to start paving it. And then he'd come to you and he'd say, I want $5,000 for myself, or I don't give you the permits for this. Fred's entire life in Poughkeepsie was shaking down people for cash. He's a small man with a big, nasty reputation. And what's interesting about Fred Andros is he's kind of disgusting. He's ugly, yet he seemed to get the ladies. And I could never figure out while I was working on this case how that came about because he was so reviled by many people. Everybody loved him or everybody hated him. So they loved him when they wanted something and then they started to hate him because of what he became. The corruption in Poughkeepsie runs high and deep. But now all of that is crumbling from above and Fred scrambles to save himself from being crushed. Fred's colleague, 
the town's property assessor, Basil Rauchy, 55, disappears on October 4th, 1997, after federal agents urge him to testify against county's Republican political boss, Bill Paroli Sr. Paroli is accused of controlling the Poughkeepsie government's shakedown enterprise. Rauchy is soon found, his lifeless body fished out of the Hudson River. Hours after Paroli's arrest, Fred Andros resigns from his 33-year water position and pleads guilty to a federal charge of conspiracy for serving as Paroli's minion. The FBI comes in, and what the FBI likes to do is look for the weakest link. And the weakest link in this case is Fred Andros, because they know he's a coward. They know if they go to him and they squeeze him, he's going to say, I'll tell you anything you want, as long as I don't go to jail. He's that guy. Fred Andros secretly negotiates with the feds to get off easy in exchange for testifying against the big boss, Paroli. He retired, he said, due to medical reasons, but he retired because he was in trouble. Newly retired, a major federal corruption case looming over him, Fred Andros answers questions about the brutal slaying of his former affair, Susan Fassett. My father was up all night with police questioning him, investigators questioning him about the death of Susan Fassett. Fred Andros and his wife hold a dinner party for friends at the time of Susan's murder. So he has an alibi. Police ask Fred if he had sex with Susan Fassett within the last 48 hours. He denies it, adding he's on a medication that renders him impotent. No gun is found in relation to the killing. Without a murder weapon, forensic examiners can only study the ballistic evidence removed from the body of Susan Fassett. She was shot with a 45 caliber pistol. And one of the bullets actually goes through both carotid arteries. So, I mean, she really didn't have a chance. Fred Andros and Jeff Fassett are cleared, really, with alibis. Both of them were not at that church when Susan Fassett was murdered. However, the officers have DNA that proves Susan had sex just before her death. They want DNA from both men, Jeff and Fred, to see if someone is lying to them. When Jeff Fassett offers up his DNA, he becomes very distraught because he realizes, wow, I didn't sleep with my wife, so that means somebody else did. And he thought they were reconciling. Jeff Fassett's response is very different from that of Fred Andros. He says, my lawyer says I shouldn't do it, so uh, I gotta listen to him, I wanna help, but I gotta listen to him. Despite his refusal, officers hatch a plan to retrieve Fred Andros's DNA. The officer stops by Fred's house and invites Fred into his car to talk about the case. He brings Andros fast food, which Fred notoriously loves. Fred's eating his burger, he's fries. But he isn't touching the soda pop, so the officer acts. Turn the temperature in the car up as high as it could go. So Fred had to take a sip. The officer now has Fred's DNA, but will he be able to secure it? And sure enough, Fred says, I'm out of here. Opens the door, walks away. Fred leaves the cup behind. He has a soda with a straw sticking out of it with Fred's DNA on the top of it. He runs that to the lab. There's a match. Fred's DNA inside of Susan Fassett. Fred had slept with Susan Fassett within hours of the murder. Fred Andros has lied to police about his relationship with Susan Fassett. So Fred is dragged in and the feds are there. And they're turning the screws for him. I mean, they must be telling him, listen... This, we're gonna, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. Now he starts to buckle. Fred Andros breaks down and tells police that it's not him they should be looking at. And the case takes another unexpected turn. Fred tells police they need to investigate someone else, Susan's secret lesbian lover. Her car is a metallic station wagon. They asked her about a gun, and she says, yeah, I, I do have a gun. They know now they have the shooter.
when family woman Susan Fassett is gunned down outside of her church, police interrogate her lover, a corrupt, reviled former city employee, Fred Andros. Police outwit Andros, who inadvertently gives up a DNA sample, which proves he recently had sex with Susan. But Andros astonishes police when he points them to who he thinks the real killer is, Susan Fassett's secret lesbian lover. My father eventually said, I think I know who did it. And they said, who? And he said her first name is Dawn. Fred Andros tells police that he engages in threesomes with Susan and her lover. And they need to look to Dawn Silverdale in Susan's death, who had the motive of jealousy. Fred has a 20-year friendship with Don Silvernail. They initially meet on Citizens Band Radio, a shared hobby. My father, his CB handle was Neptune. A fitting name given his role in the city's water department. He surely was acting like it. Like a strong arm and people pay up where you, you get no water. So on the CB radio, you had a handle. For Dawn, it was Delta Dawn. That's what she called herself over the airwaves. And what you did is you knew people without knowing them. So you spoke to them on the radio, Neptune speaking to Delta Dawn, but you don't, you don't really know who each other are as people. But Delta Dawn and Neptune are soon to meet. Dawn Silvernail, tall gap, very tall among her peers, among her friends, among her community. One of the quirky things about Dawn is she moonlighted as a country singer. When we met her, she was a very, very beautiful woman. She had long blonde hair. Dawn and Fred initially met when Fred took his wife out one night to see Dawn sing at a country bar. And here's that meeting. I'm Delta Dawn. You're Neptune. Wow. This is your wife. Wow. And my father just got caught up with her and started having an affair. But it doesn't last long sexually. The friendship lasts a lot longer. Don meets Ed Silverdale, falls in love, and gets married. Don put an end to it. She said, Fred, I'm not sleeping with you no more. I love Ed. I have a home with Ed. He's a good man, and I'm not doing that to him. She didn't seem like she would be the kind of person that would have an affair. Police are suspicious of Fred's story. I mean, this doesn't make sense. Susan was not a lesbian. Dawn, they can find no evidence of her being a lesbian, so there was no lesbian affair. What motive would Dawn have to kill Susan Fassett when they don't even know each other? Despite their doubts, authorities do their due diligence and look up Dawn Silvernail in the system. She's got a 45 that she registered, and her car is a metallic-colored station wagon. So this looks like that Don Silvernail was parked next to Susan Fassett that night, fired those shots, killed her, and drove away. Police pay Don Silvernail a visit. They asked her about a gun, and she says, yeah, I, I do have a gun. And she gives it right up. She gives the gun right up to him. That's kind of strange. Without any warrant, without any, you know, uh, contesting, she gives the gun right up. They take Don's gun in for forensic testing. When they do the ballistics and they realize the gun has been cored out, that means the barrel of the gun has just been drilled out where you can't match the striations on the bullet to the striations now on the barrel of the gun, which is almost like a fingerprint. Pouring out a gun would be basically altering the ballistics. The marks that are in that gun, you're changing them now or you're removing them. Somebody tampered with that gun for a reason. So what which comes to mind is that she figures, well, the gun's been altered. I'll give you the gun right up. You know, he's not going to tell you anything. Unlikely or not, authorities now believe that Don Silvernail is the shooter. But with a tampered murder weapon, they are unable to prove their suspicions until one of the officers makes a connection. 
This is when one of the detectives says, hey, I noticed the tree in the back. They were taking target practice back there with that gun. So maybe they were taking target practice before the barrel was cored out. Authorities go to Don's backyard. Then there were still bullets in the tree. They are able to pry a bullet out of the tree and test it against the bullets taken from Susan Fassett's body. And they find out that's the gun that shot both bullets. The one from the tree and the one in Susan Fassett's body. They know now they have their shooter, and that shooter's Don Silvernail. As the investigation leads to Don Silvernail, things start falling into place. And Don Silvernail starts to crack. They were there a couple of hours, and she broke down and said, I didn't do this on my own. She begins to tell this story now of an elaborate plan by none other than her old friend, Fred Andros. And I did it by his instruction. Don tells police she only commits the murder because Fred holds something awful over her. One of the things that Don talks about is he showed me pictures taken, like, stealthily from afar of my son at work, at home. If you don't do this for me, I'm going to release these pictures. And now, something may happen to your son. Don owes Fred Andros money, and Fred uses that power for Don. Don has been coming to Fred now for a while, asking him for money, to borrow money again. And he's lending her money. But Fred gets an idea. He says, Don, this is what I want you to do. I want you to sleep with my girlfriend. And I want to watch. So Fred wants Don to sleep with the woman he's having an affair with, Susan Fassett. He wants them two to get together so he can watch it and he can videotape it. That was his game. I'm going to get stuff on you, and I'm going to get you to do something for me. Whether it's give me money, whether it's fix something for me, or whether it's murder. I'm going to get you to do something for me, and you're going to do it. That was Fred Andrews. When Don tells the truth, Fred Andros is exposed. Police go to pick up Fred Andros for his role in the killing of Susan Fassett. So when they came in the house... The one investigator came in the house. He walked around the house to look for him. He was, they were calling Fred, Fred, where are you? We know that you're here. And then they hear a shot. What happened? So they go up and they find Fred. As cowards like Fred do, he tried to kill himself when the state police were coming for him. It's a 50-50 shot. Anything is possible when it comes to a gun. Fred misses, making a fatal shot. He shot off half of his face. You got this Fred Andros, who just basically couldn't do nothing right. Police call for an ambulance. They want to save Fred Andros' life, so he will face the consequences of his actions. Fred Andros tries to point police to his old friend, Don Silvernail, for the murder of Susan Fassett. But the plan backfires. Although Don confesses, she tells police that Fred blackmails her into carrying out his dirty work. Police rush to pick up Fred, and he shoots himself in the head. But the bullet misses the fatal path. It was a horrible sight. It was horrible. I felt terrible and sad that he had that much desperation where he thought he had to do that so for the next year fred is in jail but he gets like a year's worth of reconstructive surgery on his face to make himself look presentable they reconstructed his palate they reconstructed his nose he had he had a different nose but otherwise he was the same in february 2001 Fred Andros stands trial for the murder of Susan Fassett, and Don Silvernail is the star witness. She tells a jury of eight men and four women a lurid story of Fred's power over her. So for Don, Fred was kind of this go-to loan shark. Over the course of their friendship, 
Fred Andros lends Don thousands of dollars. As payment, Fred makes a gift of Don's silver nail to men whom he wants to please. Don and my father did have a lengthy relationship that we didn't know about until all this murder thing came out. He uses the town facilities for his illicit affairs. I know it happened in one of the pump stations. They had mattresses there, and that's where they where it happened. Don wasn't involved knowingly in any of this, but what happened was Fred would say to Don, "Take this envelope and deliver it for me, and I'll pay X amount of money." You know, and Don is thinking, "Well, she's delivering documents or whatever," but these are kind of payoffs. Dawn was the in-between. He would give her money to drop off. So Dawn is committing crimes, federal crimes, without really knowing it. And this is just one more thing that Fred Andros can hold over Dawn's head. Dawn is convinced she must kill for Fred, but she is terrified. Dawn tells this story to the jury about actually stalking Susan. She went to Susan Fassett's house one night. About a week before the murder, dressed in black, with a gun, and she was going to kill her that night, but she didn't have the nerve. Dawn said that she tried a couple of times. She went almost to her house. She said she couldn't do it. But Fred Andros is relentless. He pushes Dawn to the edge, and she finally goes over. Dawn parks beside Susan Fassett's car across from the church. She put her seat down. And waited for Susan to come out, and when Susan came out, she just sat up and she just shot her through the window. Didn't even get out of the vehicle. My father had given Dawn a different plate to put on her car just in case that they spotted the license plate. Dawn dumps the gun on a county road and pages Fred Andros with a signal that the murder is done. Fred picks up the gun, alters the ballistic imprint by coring the barrel, and then. Don retrieves it. He told her that it was all drilled out, not to worry about it. She gives the entire narrative of everything, and then she says, in tears, "I shot that poor woman. I shot that poor woman. I shot that poor woman." But she also points and says, "For him, I did it for Fred Andros. He's the one who asked me to do it." Don Silvernail's story is solidly backed up by evidence. On February 23, 2001, Fred Andros is convicted of murder in the second degree and conspiracy in the first degree in the county court of Dutchess County. He is sentenced to 25 years to life on the murder charge and eight to 25 years on the conspiracy charge. If they charged him with murder for hire, that's a capital felony in any state. He could have. Saw the death penalty. Before she receives her sentence, Don Silvernail tearfully apologizes to her own family and to the Fassett family. And I will say, in 45 books I've written about murderers, Don is the only one who had remorse, admitted to everything to me, and was actually sorry about it. Every day of my father's trial, I would always give him the thumbs up so that he would have a. It would give him a little lift, and the last day when they convicted him, I didn't give him the thumbs up. Fred wanted to be like、uh, this gangster type. He rose from a ditch digger to the superintendent, so he wasn't going to get stepped on anymore. He was going to do what he had to do to be powerful and let people know that he was powerful. Fred's prison term is to run consecutively with the federal prison sentence of 33 months for his part in the corruption scandal. I felt sorry for my father because my father was such a smart man. He could do anything, and for him to be so smart to be stupid, he thought he was smarter than the cops. He told me once that he was the smartest mother that he knew. The heinous, sordid case ends. Corruption ringleader Bill Paroli Sr. pleads guilty to one federal count of corruption conspiracy and gets a slap on the wrist, fined just twenty-four thousand dollars, and locked up for eighteen months. But the question remains: Why did Fred have Susan killed? My father had told 
worked on that Susan was going to get him into a lot of trouble because she knew more about the federal case and he didn't want her to spill her guts. But there's another take on the murder of Susan Fassett who made the choice to reconcile with her husband just before her killing. Fred Andros killed Susan Fassett for the oldest motive in the book. Revenge. If I can't have you, nobody can. You don't tell me no. You reject me, you die. That's Fred Andros. Susan Fassett pays the ultimate price for her vulnerability. I think Dawn and my father both got what they deserved. They're bad people. They're bad people. Susan Fassett was just a happy-go-lucky person, kind of hit a roadblock in her life. She had an affair, but are we to judge somebody by having an affair? That wasn't who she was. It was something she did. She met up with the devil in disguise. west of Cleveland. The city runs like five miles across Lake Erie borders at like approximately five miles and it goes about three miles inland. It's a quiet town. There wasn't much crime. Everybody knew everybody. You went to school. I mean, you, you knew who your people were, who your friends were. It was a nice area. You know, very quiet, but, you know, quaint. Like a mom and pop type thing. Pretty interesting community. Like I said, it's a big tourist area in the summer. Tourism, real good fish ships for walleye perch. It's the place Jeremy and Julene Simcoe have made their home, and it seems to suit them perfectly. There are neighbors, but none of them are too close. The couple marries in 1999, and shortly after, purchase a farmhouse and two acres of land where Jeremy runs his business. It was really secluded, but. It was beautiful. I mean, and they were really were restoring it to the charm of how the house was when they bought it. It was a farmhouse. It was, it was nice. Until early on the morning of November 18th, 2009, when emergency operators receive a frantic, terrified call. 911, police fire, ambulance. I need help. What is going on? Somebody shot my husband. Somebody shot your husband. Somebody shot my husband. Uh, our police dispatcher handled the call and they sent out our road sergeant, two patrol officers. They were the initial responders. Where is he shot at? Head. Head. Officers arrived to find a dark house with indications that the residents are more than usually security conscious. But there is no answer to their knocks or calls. When the officers got there, the door was ajar, I believe, and the Sergeant Reinheimer, he observed a 357 revolver laying on the floor. They really didn't know what was going on, just somebody had been shot. They knew that, the guns laying there. 
So the sergeant unloaded the gun. He secured the gun, took possession of it. You go to a call of a shooting, and you see a gun laying there. You pretty much have to secure it because they didn't know if there was a shooter in the house. Not knowing what to expect, the officers proceed carefully up the stairs and see light coming from one bedroom. Opening the door, they discover a gruesome scene. She was very distraught, emotional. She was covered in blood, and Mr. Simcoe was laying there, basically covered in blood. It appeared he was deceased. It's a chaotic scene, and though police try to interview Juline to find out what happened, they quickly decide she must be checked for injury at the local hospital. The police know they've got to remove Juline Simcoe from the scene. She's too upset and emotional to give them any information. But still, even though she's hysterical, she happens to remember some very specific details. At the hospital, Juline is diagnosed with situational anxiety, but no physical trauma is detected. Finally, when she's in the company of a Vermilion police officer, she starts to talk. So you fall asleep, and what wakes you up? Um, I I got my husband was shooting at something. Juline has gone upstairs because she's having trouble sleeping in bed with Jeremy. But when she's awoken by the noise, she heads downstairs to see what's going on. You were laying in the bed. Jeremy was laying in the bed? Okay. <laughs> she claimed she felt her husband's body and it was cold. She felt something on it, it was wet. This is kind of where this case gets confusing. Did you see anybody else? I'm sorry, what? Police find several bullet holes in the bedroom wall. They wonder if a gunfight has taken place in the room. A gunfight Jeremy has lost. But Juline eventually explains the holes. I heard something like something falling or something. I thought it was in the hallway. So I grabbed the gun and I went by the end of the bed and I just shot at the door. I, I thought if there was anybody that was coming up or anybody around, he always said, just to, you know, if there was ever somebody just to shoot the gun because if somebody hears a gun shooting, they're probably not gonna come towards it. They had a lot of guns in the house. The fact that she shot the gun in the house she said that normally that her husband would shoot coyotes from the bedroom window there, and so it was not uncommon. Any animal, they would just shoot, and they were hunters. The gunshots at night, that would serve as a very clear message to keep out. We never really had problems with them, per se. Maybe a few disturbance calls out there with noise or, or things that were going on at the house, but they weren't people that were known to us as far as creating trouble or problem people. Nevertheless, it's known and remarked upon by friends and co-workers that you don't drop in on Jeremy Simcoe unannounced. To actually have somebody break into Jeremy's, you probably have to have a lot of guts to do that. Short of murder, nothing involving guns is uncommon at the Simcoe property. Friends report that they even have a sniper rifle, complete with tripod. They're security conscious people, no question about it. To outsiders, it might seem extreme. Juline and Jeremy Simcoe have cameras, motion detectors, alarms of all kinds, as well as four large dogs, each one meaner than the last. When you pull into the driveway, a sound would go off and he would know when you were there. He was really protective of everything. And he should be because he had a lot of money into what he had there. They're on their own. That road was very quiet. But, you know, he had all that security and rightfully so because when you own a business, your equipment getting stolen, that's your livelihood. But the Simcoe's are not hermits, nor are they antisocial. They are regarded by neighbors as generally friendly people and are known for the events they hold on their property. Their annual summer event, the Picnic Pork Rose Party, is in its second year, and they also hold a big Halloween bonfire just a month before Jeremy's death. But after the morning of November 18, 2009, they will be known for something else entirely.
What would drive somebody to actually commit such a serious crime? Sometimes a damaged human psyche is like a tinder plant. At any moment, it can burst into flame. In a small Ohio community, a man is murdered in his own bed. His terrified wife finds the body and fires her gun to scare off the intruder she hears skulking around the house. And so begins a police investigation on a scale rarely seen in Lorain County. Once Juleen Simcoe has been taken to the hospital for examination and police are satisfied there's no active shooter in the house, Investigators secure the scene and begin gathering physical evidence. Investigators trace the trajectory of every bullet fired on the scene, including the killing shot and every discharge made by Julene Simcoe to scare away the intruder she claims to have heard. They scour the house for DNA samples and other forensic evidence to find out who other than Jeremy and Julene, has recently been present there. Meanwhile, it's the job of the investigators to put together the most complete picture of Julene and Jeremy's life before the shooting. Neighbors say they are an uncommonly close couple and rarely did you see one without the other. Joint at the hip is something police heard a lot during their questioning. Not only did the couple seem to spend every moment together at home, they also work together at the Simcoe family tree business. This kind of arrangement does work for some couples, but most people need their own space at least some of the time. They appear to love each other. They did everything together. Everyone has their lives and no one really knows what goes on behind closed doors. As investigators dig deeper, a darker picture emerges. Police hear tales that Jeremy could be controlling in the workplace. A friend and former co-worker describes several instances of verbal abuse. Jolene, however, never fights back. Investigators dig into the victim's past and discover that Jeremy has run afoul of the law a number of times in his youth, mostly on charges of assault or menacing. Evidently, in his younger days, Jeremy is prone to jealousy and badly beats Juline's ex-boyfriend. Jeremy has a softer side too, though, as most people do. Juline's friend, Jean Marie Becker, tells of the times that Jeremy was kind to her son. According to her, he would have made a great father. The way he was with my son was amazing. He was so kind and informative and really engaging. My son was really young at, at, at the time and you know he was showing him his goose because Jeremy had all these animals and chickens and just teaching my son what tree is this on his property and he was like so such a nurturer. Friends say that Jeremy and Juline want to have children of their own but aren't able to. It was nice. He just was great to me. I wish I would have known Jeremy a lot longer. And I remember I had cut my finger on a log and he patched it up and he was just the nicest person ever. And it's like, I have a really bad scar on my finger and I just think about him all the time. But he was just kind and always, you know, just nice. And that's how I met him, who he was then. And he just loved the outdoors and hunting. And But the way he was with my son, it was nice. It was comforting. Meanwhile, investigators are sparing no effort to gather the facts. We got a lot of leads and tips. We spent probably a good solid years just checking leads as they would come. We pretty much canvassed the neighborhood, talked to everybody in the area. There was a man that ended up being a witness in the trial, and he had been involved in firearms activity in the past. He had some incidents with us involving DUIs and domestics and things like that. So we'd been at his house, and he lived across the street, but... We investigated him and we, we couldn't show where he was involved in any of this. Dead ends notwithstanding, investigators poured diligently through a list of potential suspects. 
At the top of the list is the prowler Julene says she hears on the morning of the murder. And a neighbor reports a strange figure is seen on the street two nights prior to the shooting. Do you have any idea who might have come in there? I mean, do you have any suspects at all? A neighbor with the other big barn. He said there was some kid, a big kid, walking down the street. And then Jeremy said, yeah, I saw him too. But despite much investigation by police, the mysterious figure is never identified or questioned. There are reports of a suspicious vehicle parked at odd hours in the neighborhood around the time of the murder. It's been spotted more than once. Police try to determine whether the person or people inside the vehicle are either suspects or witnesses to the crime. But the answer turns out to be something else entirely. It was an abandoned school, and it turned out that, I can't remember if it was the husband or wife, but there was a little bit of uh, out of marriage romance, like a little affair was going on there. And we ended up finding who the car was, and it wasn't related. And it, I guess the people ended up having some issues because the husbands and wives didn't know about it. We were kind of sneaking around because my divorce hadn't gone through yet. And so we didn't want to be out in public a whole lot. And I remember reading about it in the paper, and sure. you had put, or whoever wrote the article, put about my white Hummer being there. And, of course, everybody at church freaked uh. out. My parents freaked out, and the whole thing blew up in my face. In-depth investigations often cause some collateral damage. And that's the case here. The police can't afford to ignore anything. We got a lot of leads and tips, and like I said, we spent probably a good solid years just checking leads as they would come. Jolene herself makes out a list of half a dozen people she thinks might possibly have been involved. She includes a man who had worked for the Simcoes and who Jolene claims is in some trouble. But the man is quickly discounted as a possible suspect. And then, less than a week after the murder of her husband, Julene Simcoe reports another shocking development. We basically had the house secured from Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and then they didn't get the key on Friday, but apparently Saturday they got the key to the house. So they went back to the house, and we had no contact with them Saturday, and Sunday they called and said the house was broken into again. Could this latest intruder be the same person who shot Jeremy Simcoe? As ever, police can't ignore the possibility even though evidence is thin on the ground. And what evidence investigators do find on the scene is less than convincing. At the top of the safe, it was like somebody pried it, like pry marks and things from this fireplace poker. And you really couldn't break into a safe like that. And then when the safe was open, we actually found a tip of the fireplace poker in there. So we actually had a guy that works on safes and it looked like it was a staged job. Even if Jolene had staged the break-in, it doesn't mean anything one way or the other about the murder. It might well have been a way for her to bring police back to the house to have a presence there so that she could feel safe, even if temporarily. Police get a lot of tips in a big case like this. There's a story that a simple family friend told police in 2014 that Jeremy was involved with a drug dealer. Investigators tracked this tip to a heavily tattooed ex-con who, as it turns out, has never heard anything about it and knows nothing about Jeremy Simcoe. Another false lead. And demonstrating conclusively that while the mills of justice in rural Ohio may grind slowly, they grind exceedingly fine. No one will be charged for the murder of Jeremy Simcoe for almost five years. Ohio, a young wife makes a horrifying discovery when she finds her husband shot to death in their bedroom. In an area where prowlers are common, investigators have no shortage of potential suspects. But even the seasoned investigators in the case can't predict where their clues will lead. One Vermilion officer has done some work with Jeremy. And when Julene announces a small party or wake for her husband, less than a week after the murder, the officer is encouraged to attend. Basically just ask him to kind of listen and see if he pick anything up as far as talking. And at one point, she just told a group of people that she wishes he could tell what really happened. And then, only weeks after the murder, 
Juline confounds her friends. A lot of people were struck by the fact that she went on a cruise right after the murder, and she took her stepbrother, who she was very close with. And, you know, it was kind of like, okay, well, your husband was just murdered and you went on a cruise. To me, it was sort of like people deal with tragedy in a different way. By 2014, five years after the murder of Jeremy Simcoe, Juline Simcoe has, by outward appearances, moved on from that shocking event. She lives in a small house nine miles away from her old home and is socializing, vacationing, and dating. But outward appearances can be deceiving. Juline is apparently still grieving and keeps a shrine to Jeremy in her house. It's the first thing you see when you come in the front door. And she's even taken a space in the house and created a Zen room, which she fills with mementos of Jeremy and photographs of their life together. She recalls some details of November 18th, 2009, with crystal clarity. When I went into the room, and he was in the bed there, and I shook him. Okay. And then I saw there was blood, and then I heard... It sounded like... I don't know, it sounded like, a, like something falling over, okay. or... I could tell where it was coming from, so I just grabbed the gun. But other aspects she appears to have completely forgotten. As they peer more closely at Juline Simcoe's behavior in the hours after the murder, investigators hear a shocking allegation from the emergency room nurse who treats Juline that morning. I asked her, so what's going on? And she mumbled something. I wasn't for sure what I had heard. So I asked her again what she said. I, I thought that she had said, I shot my husband. And I asked her again, what did you just say? And she said, my husband was shot. There's a big difference between I shot my husband and somebody shot my husband. But when someone is hysterical and they're crying, it can be hard to understand them. We can understand why the nurse would not want to report what she heard until she was sure. Julene can't recall having said such a thing. Police try all sorts of tactics to discover the truth. They ask Julene's friend, Jean Marie Becker, to wear a wire and see if she can get Juline to talk without directly asking her whether she's killed her husband. In my head, it was the right thing to do. Jeremy meant a lot to a lot of people I knew, and I wanted to help those people because they were all hurting. Jean Marie records hours of conversation with Juline, but gets little actionable information. The behavior Jean Marie observes gives her conflicting impressions. She can't understand why Juline isn't more interested in finding out new information about Jeremy's killer. I do remember she never once ever asked, who do you think did it to Jeremy? That's what bothered me. She never asked and, or never went to the police. It was sort of silence right away. Jean Marie tells of Juline's visit to a psychic where the one question she was expecting who killed my husband, is never asked. It wasn't about who killed Jeremy. It was about what her future was going to be. And that was something, too, that struck me odd. Because you love somebody and you're together all the time, you would want to know. If it was me, I'd want to know. Jean Marie also reports that Juline was a fan of a true crime show in which wives snap and kill their husbands. She was sitting in my house and we were watching the show, and it was just surreal because we just watched the show. It was the first debut, and then here, you don't want to think that's what happened. But Jolene seems to genuinely miss her husband, just like any other bereaved wife might. At one point, I did ask her if she had kept anything, and she had a cedar chest, and she pulled out one of Jeremy's shirts, and I'll never forget it. And she smelled it, and she said, I have this, and it reminds me of Jeremy. As the investigation wears on, police bring in different experts to consult. Juline's November 18th emergency call is picked apart by two people who have made extensive studies of precisely this sort of call. 911, police fire, ambulance. I need help. What is going on? Somebody shot my husband. 
In order to determine that the caller is actually the criminal, the local police bring in two experts who have analyzed hundreds of 911 calls. Listening to Jillian Simcoe's call, these analysts make a number of observations that seem to point to Jillian's guilt. In fact, on the 1 to 10 scale they have developed, Jillian scores a perfect 10 for guilt. But is Julene the type of person who could have killed another human? According to a Simcoe acquaintance, she isn't squeamish about blood and is quite capable of gutting a deer without flinching. Of course, this doesn't make her a murderer. But a family friend tells investigators that Jeremy is proud of his wife's ability with a gun. How was Julene with the guns? Was she pretty good? I never saw her shoot, but Jeremy described her as a good shot. Investigators request and receive the targets Julene has shot at when qualifying for her concealed carry permit. Here is proof outside of hearsay that Julene is no slouch with a firearm. But again, this does not connect Julene to the death of her husband in any actionable way. There's no, like, smoking gun here other than the initial gun we found, but all these little bitty things just kept piling up on top of, of another. The Simcoe's security system plays a part in the investigation. Not by what it warns of, but by what it doesn't. There's, like, an ear-piercing screech that goes off from the alarm. Well, every time one of our cars would drive or an agent's car would drive during a crime scene, you know, if you're in the house, you would hear that. And so if there's an intruder, she claims she didn't hear that, but if the intruder drove off, he would set that alarm off. They had a lot of security cameras, none of them were on. Just too much going on to be believable. Investigators explore every avenue and give Julene every opportunity to come clean. Anything you think we've missed? As in? Any questions that you think I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? She would, she, she's not going to speculate as to what you should have okay. asked her. That's your job. Every detail investigators learn seems to be a strike against Julene. Neighbors report to them that while the four Simcoe dogs usually bark every night, they've been completely silent on the night of the crime. If there has been an intruder, the whole neighborhood would have heard it. So the little things are accumulating. And in Vermilion, Ohio, even civilians have their opinions on the matter. People didn't really start talking and probably until like after two to three weeks, but everyone was afraid to ask her. I mean, we were just all afraid to ask her. How do you ask that other than what happened? In the weeks and months following the murder, the local newspapers are full of letters to the editor stating unequivocally that Julene Simcoe is the one who pulled the trigger that November morning. Naturally, with a case like this, in a smaller community like Vermilion, everyone's going to be a detective and rumors are going to fly. And the talk is that Julene killed her husband. But there's still support for her within the circle of friends that were closest to the Simcoes. Two of Jeremy's closest friends pledge to give her all the help they can. And if it turns out Julian has indeed killed Jeremy, they decide then they can hate her later. After years of investigation, the what's and who's are becoming clearer, if not yet provable. But there's still a large blank spot in the Simcoe case. The why. If Julian Simcoe has indeed killed her husband, what can be the motive? The answer is nearly as shocking as the crime itself. The brutal shooting of a sleeping man shocks a community. His wife, Julene Simcoe, comes under suspicion. And an epic investigation turns up one strange or shocking detail after another. When there's a serious crime like murder, there's always one question on people's minds. Why? What would drive somebody to take someone's life to actually commit such a serious crime? Often, the reasons aren't as clear-cut as we would like them to be. Investigators take a detailed look at the Simcoe's financial picture. We took financial documents because we had an officer to work with us. 
that he had worked for the federal government prior, so he was good on tax issues and white collar type crime. So he actually investigated that aspect to see if there's a financial reason or something that this happened. We had credit card. We had debt. Money was tight, but it's the slow time of the year. We deal with it every year like this. We have retirement money that we can use if we had to. It's just it's who was. Everything was fine. Though Julian insists they have no particular financial problems, it becomes clear that despite their prosperous tree business, they owe a good deal of money on an array of bills, and that they have been trying to purchase a plot of land behind their own property, but are denied a bank loan to do so. I've been in the property. There's no other. Financial pressures have put a terrible strain on many a relationship. Could they have been the breaking point for the Simcoes? Whether or not that was one motive, I'm not sure. But that property was great. At the crime scene, police have discovered a wide array of marital aids and explicit photos and videos, mostly highlighting Julene in various sexual situations. These give investigators another avenue of exploration in their search for a motive. Was Jeline really a willing participant in these activities? In some of the photographs, it didn't look like she was. Is this something that started right away, or I don't really remember. Like at what point? I mean, is this something that is years old, or is this something that is months old? I would. I have no idea. I think it was something that we probably had for a while. Who introduced this into the relationship? We both did. Was there somebody that had the original idea that said, "Hey, you know, why don't we do this?" I don't really remember. Okay. It was a mutual. She never claimed that she was sexually abused or physically abused by. You know, she didn't say she was a bad wife. She didn't claim that she was forcibly raped or sexually molested in any way. Individuals have said they were at your house, and and Jeremy would often order you around. Asking you to get certain pictures of you so he could show them to his guests.、Um, What kind of pictures and whom are these guests?、Uh, well, I, at this time, I'm not going to reveal the guest name, but I just well, wanted I to know. I can't answer a question that I don't know who said what and、but、what that, was being looked at. That kind of situation, then you don't recall. <coughs> We know the videos were not Julian's idea. One of Jeremy's coworkers showed him some videotapes he'd made with his wife, where they were having explicit sex. The next thing Jolene knows, Jeremy takes this idea home with him, and she's suddenly an amateur video star, whether she wants to be or not. But Jolene never wavers from her claim that she is not any kind of victim in her relationship with Jeremy. There are videos of you where pain is being inflicted upon you, and you're crying. Are you saying that you are a willing participant for all of that? I was a willing participant in everything that went on. The question one has to ask is, what was going on in Jolene's mind? Was she truly okay with this, or did she feel demeaned, debased, and humiliated? He didn't like domineer over me in day-to-day -day life.、Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we both had our strengths and we both had our weaknesses, and. Business and, and skills. Human beings are incredibly complex creatures. It's possible that Jolene was thinking two ways about this at the same time. Maybe in some ways she was drawn to her role, but in other ways she resented it, and she resented Jeremy for making her go through with it. Sometimes a damaged human psyche is like a tinder pile. At any moment, it can burst into flame, go completely out of control. All it needs is that one little spark. Thanks to something investigators discover on a Simco computer, they have a good guess just what that spark might be. A wife is suspected of murder in a small Ohio town. Public opinion turns against her, and police are feeling the pressure. 
and the key to her motive is still a mystery. The accumulation of small inculpatory detail is finally enough for investigators to press their case to a judge. I don't know if defense attorney and the people realize, but we, we took great lengths to treat her fairly with dignity, get her some help when she could, and not jump to conclusions. So we took our time before we started focusing on her as a suspect. You know, we had to question her. But it was, it was a while before we said, hey, this is probably who did it. But if she has done it, why has she done it? The couple's energetic sexual habits seem to be a factor, but in what way? A look at the computer's search records on the night before the murder appears to provide a clue. Tragically, when she was just a young girl, Jolene Simcoe was sexually abused by her own father. He was convicted of this crime and died while he was still in prison. Now in her marriage, when she should feel safe, she's forced to simulate sexual abuse and has a contract that says it's a daddy-daughter relationship. It's hard to even imagine how this would impact her self-worth. Someone at the Simcoe house had spent part of the evening, the night before the murder, looking at the obituary of Julene's abusive father. Why would that be and who would do that? Well, first of all, I would like to see that, proof of that, because I don't think that ever happened. Well, we have that proof. Well, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see what time it was and everything else. Oh, we can tell you exactly. Julie never admits she's been the one looking at the obituary. Nor does she admit to any lingering trauma from the abuse. So roughly 11 hours before your husband is shot, a person that you have a father-daughter, master-slave relationship, role-play, as you say, someone pulls up the obituary of the very person that uh, had a father-daughter sexual relationship with you. That makes one wonder if there is a nexus here or, or a tie-in uh, with this. I mean, you can understand how we might be concerned about that? I can understand. I'm telling you, I am not the one that... Okay. Is there any computer. reason Jeremy would have done that? No idea. Does anybody ever come in your home and use your computers? Mm -hmm. Who does that? We've had friends use the computers before. Okay. Nor finally does she ever admit to killing her husband. Obviously, I didn't shoot Jeremy. I didn't kill my husband. So obviously somebody else was in the house. Okay. And they weren't there for any good purposes. Investigators focus their questioning on the murder weapon that is found on the floor of the Simcoe kitchen. You'll notice that you get splashback <laughs> or blowback onto the weapon. Okay. Um, so someone took the time in between the time Jeremy was shot to clean that weapon of any blowback. If we assume your theory that there is an intruder in the home, don't you think the intruder would be in a hurry to leave if he heard the shots that you fired? I would say, yeah. But yet this intruder gained access to the house without setting off the door alarm, without being hot on the camera, without setting off any of the, the driveway alarm, without making any of the dogs bark, without being noticed by any outside sources without forcing entry into the home, has made his way into a darkened home, has found a gun on a curio cabinet that bears only your DNA, removes a gun from a holster, goes upstairs to the room where you and Jeremy typically sleep together. That person has to lean across the bed, get within two inches of Jeremy's head, pull the trigger, shoot him in the back of the head, taking his life instantaneously. Then, he lays the gun on the floor. There is no damage to the floor from the gun. There is no damage to the gun from the floor. So he lays the gun on the floor. Then again, mysteriously, exits the, the residence through the open back kitchen door. Again, doesn't set off the driveway alarm. Doesn't set off the dogs barking. And you're assuming how all this happened because you don't know. Nor do I know what transpired. What, you're what assuming else? somebody went out the back door. You're assuming... There, you're every assuming other door was secured. Too. We basically just continued investigating it. And as leads would come up, we followed them. 
but we could never establish a clear-cut motive as to why it happened. They actually did a, uh, we'll call it PowerPoint production, for lack of a better term, but it was a computer-generated presentation, so it put dogs barking, the alarms, the closeness, everything kind of into context to kind of wrap it up, because, like I say, it's kind of a confusing case, so to present it coherently to the grand jury so they can see what's going on. So that's when they were able to get the indictment. Then it probably took another year or two to go to trial. After five years of investigation, Julene Simcoe is finally arrested and charged with the murder of her husband. They had a series of pre-trials and motions and things of that nature as it wound its way through the legal process. And then ultimately she chose to go before Judge Betleski without a jury and just have a bench trial. A major factor in the trial is, of course, the murder weapon. Forensic investigation proves that it's the gun on the kitchen floor that has been used for the killing. And then has been wiped down and placed carefully onto the floor. That was my theory. I think she wanted to distract us by doing that. One aspect of the police response gets some attention at the trial. Does the sergeant, who's first in the door at the Simcoe residence, inadvertently destroy some evidence while picking up the gun on the kitchen floor? And this was a key part in the trial because you go to a call of a shooting and you see a gun laying there, you pretty much have to secure it because they didn't know if there was a shooter in the house. The officer's actions are deemed entirely appropriate and the judge determines there is no shortage of additional evidence. In a jury trial, the jurors make all the rulings on the facts of the case. So the fact about did she shoot him because she was close, things of this nature, those are issues of fact who the jury would determine. Then issues of law, a judge would determine. Did we read her our rights? She was never taken to custody, so the rights issue didn't come up. But did we have a proper search warrant? Did we maintain chain of custody? There was all legal issues. So the judge decides the legal issues, the jury decides the factual issues. But when you have a bench trial, the judge decides everything. In this case, the judge decides that the accumulated evidence is overwhelming and that Julene Simcoe has killed her husband. Because whoever killed him was laying very close to him, was one shot to the head. Again, there was like no forced entry, no strange DNA. No other suspects other than her. She went to jail, and I honestly think she didn't think she was going to jail because it had been so long, and that was that. And it was a shock to her when they took her. And she looked back, and I just put my head down, and I had to get out of there. But it was justice. tense relationship boils over. The daughter leaves home, then disappears. We track down family members, close friends. Two weeks later, the runaway's mother also disappears. Whoever has my sister, please let her go. That's when they really knew, hey, something's going on here. Only one woman is found alive. We had numerous investigators out there with crime scenes sifting through dirt for three days. Detectives are determined to bring the killer to justice, no matter how long it takes. Alton, Illinois, is an all-American town on the Mississippi, just upriver from St. Louis, It's around three in the afternoon at the Eunice Smith Nursing Home, 
where 47-year-old Bonnie Woodward, a hard-working nurse and mother of four, is finishing up her day. A long staff meeting has kept her there later than usual, and she seems eager to leave. However, Bonnie doesn't arrive home that afternoon. Everyone in Bonnie's family, they were suspicious. This was not like her behavior. Her boyfriend, Gary, has been waiting for hours, and all of his anxious calls go straight to voicemail. Though usually home by three, Bonnie sometimes joins her sister to unwind during happy hour. But tonight, as the clock ticks well past the dinner hour and closer to last call, Gary grows increasingly anxious. And it was family members that went looking for Bonnie uh, when she did not come home from work. He heads to several local bars, scanning the parking lot, hoping that he might spot her truck. But he doesn't find it. So Gary heads home, hoping that Bonnie simply lost track of time and that she'll be home soon. Gary is frantic. When the phone rings around 6 a.m., given the hour, he hopes that Bonnie has a good explanation for why she didn't return home. But there's an unexpected voice on the other end of the line. It's Bonnie's boss, wondering why she hasn't shown up for work. She wouldn't have just disappeared. She had children in the home. Um, one had disabilities, and she checked in regularly. She was a woman who had the same job for a couple of decades, only called in sick two or three times, just not a person that would normally go off the radar. So that's what led the police to suspect that there was foul play. Gary does the only thing he could think to do, go to the place where Bonnie was last seen. Much to his shock, Bonnie's truck is still parked in the employee lot, and he spots something off. Bonnie has left her windows down, something she would never do. So, Gary goes to alert the police. Her boyfriend at the time, Gary Wilmerth, reported her as a missing person to us. And at that point, uh, the patrol officers notified our detective division due to some uh, circumstances in the case that were concerning and uh, a few detectives started coming out and uh, working down some leads on trying to find her. Detective Mike O'Neill with the Alton Police Department takes in the information about Bonnie's disappearance. At first, Detective O'Neill wonders if Bonnie just might be taking some time for herself. More often than not, if a person is missing, it's uh, usually not a suspicious circumstance thing where, you know, there's foul play. It's uh, they left to go do something, didn't tell anybody about it, or they just need to get away for a little bit. When Detective O'Neill reaches out to close friends and family, everyone insists Bonnie would never leave without any notice. It really struck people that this was not Bonnie Woodward. This was not like her to just disappear. She had a family at home. It was... Things were very routine with her, with being at work and returning home, and this was very out of character. Shocked by her sudden disappearance, Bonnie's family pleads for her safe return. Whoever has my sister, please let her go. You let my sister go, and I'll come and get her. I want my sister. Investigators take a closer look at the man who reports Bonnie missing her boyfriend, Gary. A lot of times if there is foul play in a, in a situation like this, it's usually somebody that would know that person. They tracked a lot of people down. She was living with her boyfriend at the time. They interviewed him extensively. If Bonnie took off, it's only been, I'm thinking once or twice, she went two blocks over to the bar and called me up and said, I'm gonna have me a couple drinks and chill out or whatever. And On the day this happened, which was in the 25th, right, roughly? Right. Um, did you did you go anywhere at all around the time that she would have been home from work? No, I was there. Her daughter was at the house. But an alibi is only good if it checks out. So Detective O'Neill must speak with the person Gary claims he was with, Bonnie's daughter, Jennifer. Where were you at Friday? 
-hmm. when this when this all came me up. Me and Gary and my little brother Aaron and my kids were at my mom's house waiting for her. Did me Gary ever leave? No. No. Does he drive? Does uh, Gary drive? No, he don't have a vehicle to drive. Okay. He so never he was, left. He was home all day long. With Gary's alibi verified, Detective O'Neill moves quickly to figure out who was the last person to see Bonnie leaving work. I drove by her work, and her her, her truck was sitting out there. And I asked him, I was just like, uh, is Bonnie Woodward still working by any chance? Maybe she worked over. And they're like, no, we seen her leave earlier, she, around, you know, a little bit after the work meeting. He soon learns that Bonnie's co-worker saw something out of the ordinary. Bonnie getting into a silver sedan. I saw him and Bonnie out there, and for some, I, I didn't see anything strange, but it kind of seemed strange, because I guess I had never seen the man before. He was a white male. He looked like he wasn't very tall, maybe five, eight, five, nine or so. His hair was a salt and pepper, more grayer than black. She also noticed that this person was associated to a uh, silver or, or gray Chevrolet Malibu that he had on the parking lot at the time. It's not much to go on, but it makes Detective O'Neill wonder if Bonnie might have had a new love interest spicing up her life. Or perhaps she was meeting a former flame. There were a lot of members of her family who talked about an ex-boyfriend that she had, and that's when they really knew, hey, something's going on here. Then we get the lead that cracks this thing wide open. Forty-seven-year-old nurse Bonnie Woodward is last seen getting into a silver car with an unknown man. The clock is ticking as Detective O'Neill tries to locate the missing woman who has seemingly vanished without a trace in the small town of Alton, Illinois. But he must also consider that Bonnie may not be missing at all. She might be having an affair. There were a lot of members of her family who talked about an ex-boyfriend that she had. A week before she disappears, Bonnie sends a friend request on social media to an old boyfriend. But this isn't just any old boyfriend. It's Bonnie's first love that at the time turned into a long, tumultuous relationship. They interviewed him as well. But it turns out to be a short interview. Did you talk to Bonnie? No, she just wanted to uh, you know, be my friend on Facebook and I just accepted her. Other than that, I had no communications with her. Officers learn he last saw Bonnie in 2002, and he doesn't own a silver sedan. The recent friend request is just a curiosity about an old flame. Bonnie's daughter, Jennifer, has an idea who it might be, her mom's ex-boyfriend. My mom is not the type of person that's just going to hop in the car with somebody and leave her truck there, you know, unless she's expecting to come right back. Who does this guy sound like to you? It's Chester. I mean, I, I don't like to pinpoint a guy out, but Chester fits every description. And like the Silver Impala, his mom and dad has a Silver Impala. According to Jennifer, the two had a rocky relationship that ended when Gary entered her mother's life. And Chester also fits the physical description of the mystery man from the parking lot. You dated her for how long, sir? We started dating, and I was with her for probably a year. She kicked me out, and then next thing I know, Gary's living there. Despite a history of domestic violence and a bad breakup, Chester is genuinely concerned about Bonnie's whereabouts. You think she's okay? Right now, what's your gut saying? I'm scared. Okay. You know, because she's never done this before that I've ever known. But a call to his employer, a local construction company, verifies that he was at work when Bonnie went missing. Now, I hope to God nothing wrong, and if I see her or hear anything, I'll let you know. Investigators fear they are running out of leads when Detective O'Neill discovers that Bonnie isn't the only person who has gone missing from the Woodward household. 
The main thing that we were able to gather from those interviews, and especially with family and friends and the uh, current boyfriend, was that she had a 17-year-old stepdaughter, Heather Woodward, uh, who was recently reported missing um, or as a runaway. My little sister, okay, is 17 years old. She's got a missing persons report like two and a half, like two to two and a half weeks ago. And that's when they really knew, hey, something's going on here. We have a woman that's missing and her stepdaughter had been reported missing days before this as well. Could these disappearances be connected? There was nothing definitive that said the two were related, but we certainly felt that that was something that we, a path we needed to go on. According to Bonnie's family, Heather might be staying with a trusted high school teacher. She kept saying she was going to move in with this teacher. This is the daughter? Yeah. And Bonnie said, no, you're not. And I mean, this went on and on and on. Bonnie talked to the principal of school. She said, that, that's not going to happen. We narrowed in on a teacher in a neighboring uh, city called East Alton that Heather was last seen with her. Detective O'Neill tracks down the teacher, who at first seems a bit guarded. While friends and family describe Bonnie as a loving mother of four, Christine paints a different picture. I had uh, Heather in Alpha One class as a freshman, and she had been very vocal to myself and all the other teachers of the abuse that goes on at home. She tells the detective that Bonnie and Heather had a volatile relationship. One that went downhill when Heather's father died eight years ago, leaving Bonnie as sole guardian. While the relationship was generally bad, tensions flared in recent weeks. Heather and Bonnie constantly fight over Heather's wish to attend college. Christine hopes she could provide a safe haven for the teen until emotions cool down. And it was during that interview with her that... She said that Heather had left her residence and she didn't know where she went. Bonnie called us the night of the 16th. She left a message on my, my phone that she was coming tomorrow to get Heather and Heather should pack her stuff. So, and I did tell her she had to go back home. So, and she, okay. she cried most of the night. And then whenever you came back on the 17th, she was gone. Right. Locating Bonnie's stepdaughter is now Detective O'Neill's number one priority. We just knew that our investigation was going in two separate angles. One, we needed to find Heather, and two, we needed to find Bonnie and, and see what the situation was with either one or if there was any relationship between those two. But without any clear leads, O'Neill worries that both cases might run out of steam. About a week after Bonnie goes missing, police get an unexpected phone call. Heather Woodward just walked into the town library. She showed up at the East Alton Library on her 18th birthday on July 3rd, 2010, and basically said, I'm Heather Woodward. I've been reported as a runaway. It's been eight days since Bonnie Woodward went missing after leaving work. Investigators have exhausted all viable leads when Bonnie's runaway stepdaughter, Heather, suddenly returns. Detective O'Neill wonders if the stepdaughter may have been involved in Bonnie's disappearance. At that point, I went in to interview Heather and talk to her about where she'd been. Hey, Heather, this is Detective Mike O'Neill from All Police Hello. Department. We just need to ask you a few things here. The first initial interview with Heather was, I can't think of a better word than weird. Um, Heather was very, for an 18-year-old, was very immature. She was holding a teddy bear with her. Her tone of voice sounded like a little girl's. I packed my stuff and I left. I wasn't going home for two weeks to be kicked out again. And then what happened? And then I went to stay at a friend's house. Okay. And who was that? Just a friend. I don't want to get him in trouble. Detective O'Neill wonders if this teen has something to hide. Because you understand that Bonnie's missing right now, and we don't have a clue where she's at. So anything that would help us, any other leads or information, would be great. They they don't know nothing. They don't like Bonnie. I don't 
I don't want to know where Poggy's at. Heather seemed upset about the overall situation, but in talking to her, it was just trying to assess where she's been, uh, what she's been doing, why she took off. Heather claims she has a lot of reasons for running away. Her relationship with Bonnie has gone from toxic to downright poisonous in the weeks before Bonnie's disappearance. Bonnie can be mean, and sometimes she hits. Bonnie decided to tell me to pack everything and just get out. I was afraid to go home. But it isn't just typical mother-daughter tension. Heather explains that Bonnie refuses to support her financially after she turns 18, when her father's death benefit checks would come to an end. Heather wants to apply to college, but Bonnie refuses to help. While this tracks with what Detective O'Neill has heard so far, it still doesn't answer the biggest question. Where was Heather when her mother disappeared? And at that point, all we knew is she left the teacher's house and nobody had seen her. Heather eventually told police who she had been with during that time. I stayed with some people from the church. So it's Nathan Carroll's family? She provided information saying that she was with the Carroll family. Um, she ultimately had attended church with the Carroll's son, and that's how she kind of began to know the family. She identified Roger and Monica Carroll as being the parents. In order to verify Heather's story, investigators head to the Carroll home to interview the church family who welcome Heather into their home. After interviewing them, they acknowledged that Heather was with them. They acknowledged that they knew Heather was a runaway. And it was ultimately just their explanation, and especially Roger's explanation, was um, based on things that Heather had told them, they were keeping her safe. Right off the bat, Heather's alibi checks out. But investigators are stuck by a couple of uncanny details. Roger Carroll fits the physical description of the salt and pepper mystery man. And there's a silver car parked in his driveway. So those were obviously some key points that we were looking at, but still there was nothing there to 100% say that he was the person uh, or they did have that involvement in her disappearance. But in order to make sure, Detective O'Neill asks the Carrolls to come down to the station to talk further. They brought all three of the Carrolls into the police department and interviewed them all. They said that Heather had been staying with them, that they don't know anything about Bonnie, that Heather reported that, that Bonnie was somewhat abusive to her, and they don't know Bonnie, had never seen Bonnie, didn't know where she lived or worked. Just basically, we know nothing about Bonnie, but we had Heather with us. Under questioning, Roger denies having ever met Bonnie Woodward. He is only trying to help his son's friend. As far as uh, Bonnie, you've, you've never had a conversation with that woman and you've never um, been face-to-face -face with that woman. You, you know where she lives, but you've never, other than you've driven by there, like two times, right? Yes, that's correct. Satisfied that Roger is being truthful, Detective O'Neill chalks up the similar hair and car to coincidence, but explains to the Carols that they are not entirely off the hook. The two adult Carols, Roger and Monica, were charged with harboring a runaway, um, and obstructing justice. The couple are booked and fingerprinted, then sent home. Another lead in the case goes cold. Despite the setbacks, Detective O'Neill refuses to give up. He hopes to provide some form of closure to Bonnie's distraught family, who fear the worst. We're still looking for Bonnie. We're still looking for any information related to her disappearance. And... Nothing. It, it just went silent with anything coming in. As the weeks pass, fears grow Bonnie may never be found, dead or alive. Then in September of 2010, we get the lead that cracks this thing wide open. It gives me goosebumps to think about it. There was an extensive search, close to 40 or 50 law enforcement officers. We took numerous firearms from the house and large amount of ammunition. Two 
weeks after running away, Heather Woodward returns, but her stepmother is still missing, and now presumed dead. The church-going family who provide refuge to Heather appear to be good Samaritans, assisting a teen in distress. And just when the investigation seems to be turning ice cold, Detective O'Neill gets a phone call that flips the case on its head. The Illinois State Police Crime Lab gets in contact with our department and they notify us that there were fingerprints that we had obtained and sent to the lab for, for analysis. And of those prints, there were prints that matched up with Roger Carroll. It's a stunning turn for the investigation, and no one is more surprised than Detective O'Neill. During Roger's initial interview, he had said that he never had contact with Bonnie. Based on our interpretation from that interview, there'd be no reason for him to have ever touched her vehicle. So at this point, we knew that he had at least provided false information. It's enough to take Bonnie's case out of the deep freeze. The matched Prince and Roger Carroll's connection to Heather are enough to obtain a search warrant for the Carroll's property. The district attorney's office is also informed that the Carrolls are now under suspicion for Bonnie's presumed murder. So after the police got the information that Roger Carroll's fingerprints matched Bonnie Woodward's car, uh, there was an extensive search. Dozens, if not close to 40 or 50 law enforcement officers went to the Carroll property. But this search will not be easy. There's 60 acres of land there. We're just looking for anything at that point. We're searched the vehicles, searched the house, searched the property for anything that may be linking Bonnie to that property or to that family. It was very difficult to search such a wide area for specific evidence. Unfortunately, they don't find any trace of Bonnie, but do find something else that heightens their suspicions. During that search, we took numerous firearms from the house. They had close to 30 firearms and a large amount of ammunition, more than I could even count, uh, that was inside this house. But also we had to understand that this is uh, a rural country area. You know, it's not too shocking for a family to collect guns and have a large amount of guns. You got a lot of guns in the house, right? A few. A few. Um, and you target practice, I guess, routinely? Some. I, I, not as much as I used to because the ammo's got... What do you usually target practice with? Handguns or long guns? Or It depends. I mean... Um, I mean, a little of each. And it was at that point... Roger was interviewed, and more specifically this time, had he ever had contact with Bonnie? Had he ever touched her truck? Any chance your fingerprints would be on Bonnie's car? On the driver's door? Like all over it? No, oh, no way, no. No chance? No. Okay. And then when faced with the situation of fingerprints of his were on her truck, on the driver's side door, basically in the same area that it was reported that this unknown person was talking to her at the end of her work shift. Why were those prints there? Any chance your DNA would be all over that driver's door? No. No way. And what do we, how do we explain it if it is? They're not been trained. <laughs> I mean, no, there's no way that my fingerprints are on that car door or my DNA is on that car door. There's just there's no way. Your prints are on that door. Confronted with this damning fingerprint evidence, Roger doubles down on his story. His explanation was they weren't his. He had never touched her truck. And he, the only thing he can come up with that he was been framed. And no other explanation to, to show for why those prints were there. Roger Carroll was charged with a felony obstructing justice. And that was pretty much the end of the conversation at that point. Investigators have to answer a confounding question. Why would Roger Carroll want to kill Bonnie Woodward? Could Heather have encouraged him? Investigators interview Heather, who is now attending college. Has there ever been any point where he has ever seen Bonnie that you know of? No. Has there been any point where he has ever seen her car, at least? So in that interview, we made it clear to her about the fingerprint that were found on the truck. What we're trying to tell you right now, there's new physical evidence in this case. That's why we're recontacting you. Okay, and this is what we need to know. 
There is no reason for his prints to be on Bonnie's truck. No, there's not. She seemed genuinely shocked that there would be that contact. She didn't know of any circumstance in which Roger would have ever touched her vehicle. O'Neill is unable to prove conclusively that Heather has no knowledge of what Roger Carroll did on that day in June when Bonnie disappeared. I don't want them to come back in their interviews right now and say that Heather told us to do it. No, I didn't tell them because I don't want that to happen to Bonnie. Under questioning, she denies any involvement and seems very distraught by the possibility that Roger has something to do with Bonnie's disappearance. Without a body, a murder weapon, or a witness, Detective O'Neill's hands are tied. Ultimately, if something did happen and there was foul play, trying a, a, a homicide without a body would be very difficult, and it's, uh, it's difficult to prove. So having only the fingerprint and a few conversations just wasn't enough um, for us to push it over. Sharing this disappointing reality with Bonnie's family dredges up hard emotions. Those conversations I had with the family was very difficult during that time and the years that had gone by without anything, any new leads and nothing else. And at this point, the Carroll family had shut down. They did not want to speak to us any further. Um, and we knew that there was nothing else that we could do at this point other than just wait. And once again, the Bonnie Woodward case goes cold. Until a special prosecutor takes up the case file, almost by chance. I was with the Madison County, Illinois State's Attorney's Office for 18 years. I personally became interested in, in cold cases that were in my office at the time. And I asked my supervisor if I could begin looking into some cold cases. The Bonnie Woodward case just happened to be the first one I pulled out. After steeping herself in the facts, Jennifer Mudge is certain that Roger Carroll has gotten away with murder. All we had was his, print, his prints on her car, and we did not have her body. Faced with the same challenges Detective O'Neill confronted eight years ago, Mudge realizes there's not much she can do. But two months later, she receives a phone call that changes everything. They called me to tell me that Roger Carroll had attempted suicide. He had committed a domestic battery on his wife, Monica, and um, then he had walked off into the woods, injected himself with insulin, and a Jersey County Sheriff's deputy found him unresponsive, near death. He was taken to a hospital and arrested for the domestic battery. And at that point, we thought, this may be our time to try it again, to see if there's anything new that we can establish, to get going with this case again on, as far as Bonnie's disappearance. This may be our only opportunity to, to continue forward. But it's not Roger he wants to focus on. It was after that that we reached out to Monica and ultimately explained to her our situation in the case. She was willing to speak to us at this time. Investigators learned that Monica is divorcing Roger for infidelity. We have been living separate in the home. Okay. He actually moved out of the bedroom, went to a separate part of the house. He connected up with a woman at work and had an affair. And given the current state of her marriage, she's now willing to tell them everything she knows. If Roger Carroll gets out, I am scared to death that he will come after me. Forty-seven-year-old Bonnie Woodward has been missing for years, and the case has gone cold. With no body, the only piece of evidence, a set of fingerprints belonging to Roger Carroll, are not enough to convict. I mean, no, there's no way that my fingerprints are on that car door, or my DNA is on that car door. There's just there's no way. Your prints are on that door. But now, a new investigator interested in the case has stumbled onto a twist in Roger's life. He's just tried to commit suicide, and his wife, Monica, has some shocking information about him. She was able to discuss several situations and circumstances with Roger, ultimately saying that Roger never came right out and told her that he is responsible for Bonnie's disappearance or death at the time. He told me he didn't have anything to do with it. So I believed him. I 
at that point in my marriage. She talked about a large fire that was being stoked on the property. There was a big brush pile that he just burnt uh, for a long time, and I'm talking days. How far was this from the house? Pretty close. Monica's suspicions alone are not enough to move the needle forward. So they turn to another family member who may now feel free to talk with Roger behind bars. We had a meeting, the investigators, myself and my co-counsel, and we thought the first person we would want to speak to would be the son. Because at the time of Bonnie's murder, the son was 16 years old. So fast forward eight years later, his mom has just been beaten by his dad, and he might have some things to say about something that he saw back in 2010 that he, as a 16-year-old, would not have wanted to say. But Nathan is unwilling to speak with detectives. However, he is willing to testify for a grand jury on one condition, that he be granted immunity. Nathan's testimony is nothing short of explosive. He claims that his father became increasingly enraged with Bonnie's alleged mistreatment of Heather and made it his mission to save her, unbeknownst to the runaway teen. His dad told him that Bonnie, Heather's stepmom, had to go, that she was going to bring bad things their way, and that they had to take care of it. They stopped by Bonnie's house. They stopped by Bonnie's work. His dad specifically commented, good, she's at work. They went back to the house. His dad trimmed his beard, put a ball cap on, trimmed his fingernails, got one of the guns in the home, and left. A couple hours maybe later, Nathan says his father came home. He heard the, the car pull in the driveway, and he heard a few gunshots. Nathan was sitting at the kitchen table. When he walked out, he saw feet, and he remembered that there were scrubs on the feet, and Bonnie worked in, um, she worked at a nursing home, so she wore scrubs every day. He walked around the corner, and he saw Bonnie Woodward laying on the side of the house, dead. He saw his dad shoot her one more time. Freed from his father's controlling presence, Nathan unloads the terrible burden he's carried for years. This, this is where she laid. Okay. Roger obtained this front loader from their property and ultimately picked up Bonnie's body, took her back to what was described by Monica as the burn site. Her deceased body was burnt in an attempt to get rid of the evidence. Following these multiple days of burning, they took that same front loader, um, scraped off the top a few inches of soil at that burn site, and then dumped these ashes and, and dirt into a nearby creek that runs through their property. And then he also walked us to this area as well to point out this area. He took them on a walkthrough, showed them where she was shot, um, showed them where the burn pile was, and then he came with investigators back to the police department where they had, they had seized all of Roger Carroll's guns. We showed him several guns, and he did point out a 9mm semi-automatic handgun at the time. And he had said that that was the one that his father had used on that day. Nathan's testimony is shocking, but it's not enough to convict his father without physical evidence. Police obtain another search warrant, and this time they know exactly where to look. After we learned where to look for evidence, another massive search happened. Um, this time I would say oh, over 100 law enforcement officers went out to the scene. It was a, a meticulous search that happened for three days. The area next to the house, which would be the site where she was ultimately shot and killed, we did find shell casings, at least one that was a 9mm shell casing, 9mm being the same gun that was used and Nathan identified. We also found a 9mm firearm projectile. But investigators worry that the day's long fire may have destroyed any ballistic markings that would match the bullet to the 9mm. So they send the evidence to firearms experts for specialized testing. 
bullets, by their very nature, are designed to survive heat. When they are fired, they undergo the friction of rubbing up against the barrel, which produces a lot of heat. Also, they're exposed to a lot of heat when the cartridge itself is designated and the gases are burning beside them or behind them. So they're able to withstand a great deal of heat. They took that bullet from the crime scene and they compared it to test fires from the semi-automatic 9mm weapon and they looked at it under a comparison microscope and determined that that bullet was fired from that weapon. It's a perfect match. At long last, investigators finally have their murder weapon. But what they don't have is a body. At the burn site, we found some more shell casings, but also what appeared to be charred remains of bone fragments. The bone fragments are too damaged by fire to yield any DNA, but there's still enough to build a case. On the strength of ballistics testing, Along with the fingerprints and Nathan Carroll's eyewitness testimony against his father, Roger Carroll is finally charged with the murder of Bonnie Woodward. On June 25th, 2010, Roger W. Carroll lured Bonnie Woodward from Madison County to a location in Jersey County, where he then ended her life by shooting her, and then concealed her death by placing her in a fire and burning her remains. Roger was charged in Jersey County with three counts of first-degree murder and aggravated kidnapping and concealment of a homicidal death. The trial was, it was lengthy. It's in essence a no-body homicide. We never really were able to locate Bonnie's body, which is something that, you know, very rare that you ever see. I believe that there have been less than 500 cases in the world that have been tried and convicted without a body. It's very, very rare to try a case without a body, let alone get a conviction without a body. Ten years after Bonnie vanishes, Roger Carroll finally faces a jury. Ultimately, we went to trial on one count of first-degree murder. The jury deliberated for approximately three to four hours, I believe, and um, they convicted him of first-degree murder. Roger was very controlling. That was confirmed with the statements. That was something that I even perceived as how this family was ran back in 2010 when this case first came to them, is that he had a, a really strong hold on this family, uh, over his wife, over his son. People have blamed Nathan as being complicit in this murder, and that just is not the case. Nathan ultimately coming forward was a big step in the investigation. He certainly could have kept that quiet. He was a, a boy who had a murderer for a father. He was scared. He did what his father told him to do. Not only is he not a murderer, but he's sort of a hero because it took a lot of guts for him to stand up in that courtroom and tell the truth. We couldn't have done any of this without him and his statement. With his conviction finally secured, Bonnie's family can begin healing from their decade-long trauma. The family knew that Roger was responsible. Um, and this was more closure for them, knowing that all, all these years of uh, Bonnie disappearing and people still, some people out there were saying that Bonnie just walked away or she left, which they knew wasn't true. They knew that something happened to their sister, to their mother. Um, and this was a good conclusion for them to kind of put this thing to rest and start to move on. As difficult as it is for them to do that. She had a lot of people that loved her and she gave a lot of love to a lot of other people as well. So her family, to say that they were with me every minute of every day of that trial is an understatement. I talked to every one of them multiple times per day. They, they were present for all of it and they I think, breathed a big sigh of relief when it was over.
Thank you.